Excitation contraction coupling in cardiac muscle is similar in many ways to skeletal muscle with some important differences. I'm going to actually flip over here to a uh, blank note page to do a little bit of drawing. And I drew this briefly um, in one of my previous lectures, but I want to just kind of quickly recap. If we assume that this is my pacemaker cell, and I'm not going to draw all the details there in the pacemaker cell, we're just going to say sufficiently that, that we have this uh, pacemaker potential that is, is uh, generating a steady rhythm of action potentials in this pacemaker cell. So if we were to graph that, it would look something to that effect. And as mentioned in the previous video, we have gap junctions that exist in my pacemaker cell. And so as calcium flows in to the cell, recall that the depolarization phase, the I funny channel is due to um, sodium influx. But the, this portion right here, this rising phase is due to the influx of calcium ion. And then the falling phase again, just as a recap, is due to the influx or the efflux of potassium ion. And you'll remember that efflux with an E, I'm exaggerating the E, but is um, calcium moving out of the cell, uh, potassium moving out of the cell. So as calcium flows into my adjacent contractile fiber through the gap junctions, it's that calcium that's going to generate the depolarizing stimuli, uh, which again, just going to recap here for you. And it's this part, this is where we start to look at what we would call the excitation contraction coupling. So excitation referring to the generation of an action potential in the cardiac contractile fiber uh, versus contraction, meaning um, this is where we're going to get the sharp, shortening of the sarcomeres, the sliding filament uh, theory those cross bridge cycles, all of that that we're going to talk about. So as the calcium enters into the cell, the excitation part is that it's going to start opening up channels, particularly voltage gated channels, and we're going to get the opening of these voltage gated uh, sodium channels, which will allow cal sodium into the cell, depolarizing the membrane even further. So with calcium plus sodium, we're depolarizing that membrane. And that's going to give us the upward, let me kind of jot this in, that's the depolarizing um, rising phase of the action potential for the cardiac myocyte, the contractile fibers. And then of course we're going to have the opening of those voltage gated potassium channels. And that potassium is going to leave the cell, efflux, and that's actually going to generate for us um, kind of that beginning of the falling phase right there. It's a little bit sharper there as the potassium leaves the cell. And these changes in the membrane potential will then stimulate the opening of the voltage-gated L-type calcium channels that I mentioned previously. And those are located, um, I'm drawing them in the T-tubule. I don't know that that's the only place they're located, but that's just where I tend to draw them. Um, and those L-type calcium channels will open, allowing calcium into the cytoplasm of the cell, or since we're dealing with the muscle, it's a sarcoplasm. And then, of course, that calcium is going to generate... Um, actually, let me change colors. Red is not going to show up, so I'm going to use green instead. It essentially competes with the potassium. So as the potassium leaves, the cell becomes more negative, but as the calcium comes in, the cell becomes more positive. And so we get this broader slope that I talked about previously um, due to the influx of both potassium, I'm sorry, the efflux of potassium. So this part, we've got potassium efflux. I guess it doesn't like that. Potassium efflux, nope, not gonna let me write that. Oh well, just go with it for me. And also calcium influx. So that's both happening right here, potassium efflux and calcium influx. At the same time at that uh, region that I've drawn in green.
In addition to the calcium coming in through the L-type calcium channels, this is where the ryanodine receptor gets activated through the... So here's my sarcoplasmic reticulum here. Ryanodine receptor going to be activated there in this channel by calcium. And so as that ryanodine receptor is activated by calcium ions, the calcium that's flowing in from the L-type calcium channel, we're going to get even more calcium entering into the cytoplasm or sarcoplasm. And that is the calcium that is also contributing to this calcium influx right here. Uh, the slow influx to balance out the efflux, the rapid efflux of potassium ions. And then when we get the closing of these calcium channels, that's when we're going to get the repolarization phase, like so. And not quite that steep, but anyway, it gives you the basic idea there. And that's due to continued potassium efflux while the calcium channels are closed. I've talked about that, so this is just a really quick recap. It is an important thing to know, and so it's something I'd suggest you practice drawing. Now, as with all muscle cells, we need a method for relaxation. And so, of course, the moment calcium hits the cytoplasm, the sarcoplasm, we're going to have our lovely little protein pump here. This is my potassium. I'm sorry, this is my calcium 2 ATPase. This is what happens when I try to talk fast, my mouth and my brain. And Anyway, so this is a calcium ATPase. And that calcium ATPase allows calcium, or actually not allows, forces calcium back into the cell at the cost of ATP. So it's going to burn ATP somewhat rapidly uh, to pump that calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that begins working the moment the calcium enters the cell, the cytoplasm. But of course, um, if we've got those calcium channels open, the signal from the calcium is overwhelming, and so it builds up in the cytoplasm. It's not until those calcium channels close that the calcium uh, ATPase can actually make any headway or significant headway. So back to the excitation contraction coupling part. Uh, so that's the excitation part, right? Now we're going to do the couple it to the contraction, and that of course is going to involve that calcium ion. Now we're going to see a setup very similar to what we see in skeletal muscles in that we're going to have a Z line. Let me kind of briefly sketch in a pretend Z line right here. Somewhere off, off screen, we're going to have another Z line also known as a Z-disc, recall that. And you'll remember that the Z-line is an anchoring point for actin. I'm going to just draw one um, actin fiber here, and as I've done before, I'm only going to draw it um, as a single fiber of globular actin polymerized together. This is, of course, not how it really looks. It's a helix. There's two polymers twined together in this helix. Um, but in, in a cardiac muscle, once again, we're going to have the protein tropomyosin getting in the way. And so that tropomyosin exists in calcium or in, in cardiac muscle. It also exists in skeletal muscle. So this tropomyosin, this is going to be blocking the binding site on actin for myosin, the, the site at which myosin and, and actin um, hold hands, if you will, is blocked by that tropomyosin. And just like we see in skeletal muscle, we're going to have troponin sitting on the top here. Um, it's a complex, of course, with uh, three proteins in it. And again, I, you know, I usually don't say troponin complex, I just say troponin. But that's going to sit right there, and that is going to be our governor, and that's going to control how this actin behaves, uh, or what's going to happen, more specifically how the tropo, uh, tropomyosin behaves. So this is my troponin here. And then calcium, of course, the calcium that's coming from the L-type calcium channel, the calcium that's coming from the ryanodine receptor, it's going to come in here and it's going to bind the trop tropomyosin. And so now if we look at that, and I'm just going to sketch in 
Oh, before we go on to sketch the next part, let me sketch in my uh, myosin filaments. So myosin would be anchored to an M line. I'll draw it right here just to kind of have reference. And we would have these myosin fibers twined around each other. But I'm just going to draw the one fiber um, and just one head. And so, of course, my myosin head's going to be in the cytoplasm. And to be activated, just like with skeletal muscles, that myosin head has to bind. Uh, ATP activates it. So it's going to bind to that myosin. And then when ATP is hydrolyzed, that myosin is going to move back into what we call the cocked position. And so that's going to be ready to bind. Oops, sorry, don't have much room there. We'll kind of fix that, but uh, ready to bind that actin. And it is, of course, bound to uh, ADP and an organic phosphate in this this state. So uh, that's the activation process for myosin. It's the same as we see in the skeletal muscle. So now we're going to move in and we're going to see what it looks like with um, with the tropomyosin out of the way. And I'm just going to draw a small segment of this actin instead of the whole whole thing. But here we've got my actin, my tropomyosin, I'm going to draw it right here. In previous drawings, I kind of just left it out, but we're just going to put it right here so you can see it's moved. And we'll put some troponin in here so you can see that. And that troponin, I'm just going to draw a circle for the calcium, but here's my calcium, this big old red circle right here is my calcium bound to that troponin, which causes the tropomyosin to move out of the way. And now I can bind to the uh, actin binding sites. So if my myosin head has been activated, then it will be in the cocked position. It's going to bind to my myosin, um, and that's my cocked position, cocked. Uh, in my cocked position, it will be bound to ADP and inorganic phosphate, just as a reminder. And then when my inorganic phosphate leaves, that binding is going to become much tighter, and that's going to cause us to execute the power stroke, where myosin is going to drag actin toward the M line. And so the entire actin fiber will shift so that this myosin, or this actin right here, um, this one here, is going to essentially move down so that it will now occupy this spot right here. And so that's called the power stroke. Moving forward, this is my power stroke. And then in this stage, we're in rigor state. And just like with skeletal muscles, if I want to break rigor state, I need my ATP to enter into or imbibe that myosin, at which point then we get hydrolysis of the ATP into inorganic phosphate, and we once again move into the cock position. So this is exactly as we've described it with skeletal muscle. And I'm only revisiting it because it's important for you to recognize that this is happening in cardiac muscle too. This is how the force is generated in the cardiac muscle. Um, and so we get this contraction, and that's what we're looking at over here. If we look at these, these pictures here, this diagram here represents what's happening here, ideally, in that we have calcium enters in through um, those gap, chunk, gap channels, opens, in this case, this picture only has drawn the voltage-gated calcium channels. I'm sorry, voltage-gated sodium channels, the potassium channels are not shown. But please know that they exist. In fact, why don't we just go ahead and draw in some potassium channels because, you know, no good neglecting those. So here's my potassium channels, and they're voltage gated, and they're letting my potassium out of my cell. Um, and then we get, of course, the opening of these voltage gated calcium channels, which I've named, not me somebody else is named. These are my L-type calcium channels. There's something called a T-type calcium channel. I'm not worried about you knowing that particular nomenclature. This right here, um, L-type calcium channels, um, that one I do want you to know that term. And then of course the calcium enters into the cell. 
And then here's my ryanidine receptors, which in this particular figure, it just labels it as a calcium release channel. So let's write ryanidine down. I'm just going to abbreviate RYR, standing for the ryanidine receptor. Calcium is released from that. And then here we can see that the calcium is going to come in here, and, and we get this calcium troponin complex, and that generates my contraction. As my sliding filament, what we're going to do then is, is pull the actin myosins and to uh, actin toward the M line. Here's my M line. And therefore, you know, essentially my Z disc is going to slide forward. Let's say our new position is right here. And this Z disc is going to slide, and maybe my new position is right here, and my sarcomer has now shortened. due to the sliding filament model. And then here we can see my calcium ATPase, my pump, working hard to put calcium back into the cytoplas or to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And so that's basically what this figure is summarizing. And here we can get the summary of that cross bridge cycle uh, as I showed you on the other page. This is a different orientation just to help you orient. Um, this is my cocked position here. And this is my rigor state here. Uh, yeah, so let me add an arrow to show that ADP also is leaving at that point. And again, I, I've mentioned this before, but I don't know for sure whether ATP leaves during the power stroke or after. I've seen different textbooks say different things. Uh, the important part is that it's certainly gone by the time ATP binds and breaks rigor state. And so that's what these processes walk you through. You can see step by step we have one, calcium entering through the L-type calcium channel, two, cal this is the coupling to the contraction stage part, three, calcium initiates muscle contraction by binding to troponin, um, and then we get the cross bridge cycle. Uh, and then for the relaxation part, this is relaxation. Which also is diastole, as we've mentioned. And calcium is removed from the cytoplasm uh, by the calcium ATPase. Um, there are other pumps. I forgot to mention that. Let's draw them in really quickly. So in the cytoplasm, or the sarcoplasm, again, because we're dealing with muscle, I always forget to call it sarco, but um, anyway, in the sarcolemma, the cell membrane, we have this, let me actually not draw it as a channel, because it's not a channel. We'll draw it as another pump. So we have another protein pump here, and this protein pump is actually a secondary active transporter. And what it's going to do is it's going to allow sodium to enter my cell. Uh, and that's going to be by diffusion. So this is, of course, facilitated diffusion, this part of it. But in exchange for sodium moving into my cell, calcium is being thrown out of my cell. And that's um, active transport. So when you put those two processes together, you combine them together. Together, this whole thing we would call the exchange pump, and this is called the sodium calcium exchanger. Let me jot that down somewhere. We'll put it here. Sodium calcium exchanger. Uh, that sodium calcium exchanger, when we combine diffusion with active transport, is a secondary active transport, which you may call recall. So I told you there was a reason I taught you all about transports, because we see them again, right? We're seeing a secondary active transport here. The calcium ATPase is the primary active transport. Um, ryanidine receptors facilitate diffusion, etc. right? So these are all transporters. This is why we've talked about them. Secondary active transport here is for my exchanger. And so that's basically the process there of contraction and relaxation in the skeletal muscle. Now you looked at this figure before, but I just want to briefly remind you, in fact I'm going to um, erase some of this 
scribbles here, maybe not. Um, and just so you can kind of see it easier, we talked about this, how the contraction phase and the um, action potential in the skeletal mu or in the cardiac muscle, because of the broadness of that action potential, we get a significant amount of overlap and a very broad absolute refractory period. And this is so that we can have that relaxation phase, so that the cell or so that the um, heart can fill with blood in between each contractions. And that's basically it. That's it in a nutshell. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more now. We're going to go into the cardiac cycle, which is lots of fun.